This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tent. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your Sanctify us in your truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Acts chapter 16. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, Setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside to the gate to the riverside, where, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira and a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Revelation chapter 21. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. 
And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the 12 gates, angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were, writ the, were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fifth chapter. Glory to you. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going another steps before, down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. O Christ. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house, and the place. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place. The Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs. We confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text from the Gospel lesson. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Archaeologists excavated this pool of Bethesda. It is as John describes it. It's huge, trapezoidal in shape. It has porches around it. It has steps in each corner going down into the water. Apparently, the pool was fed by an intermittent spring, which would make the surface of the water bubble now and then. There's superstition surrounding this pool. People believe that whenever the surface of the water was disturbed, that indicated the presence of an angel. And at that moment, they believed, the water had sudden curative powers. But only for the first person to get in. So the sick gathered around the pool, waiting and watching for that water to be agitated, and then everybody tried to scramble in. Silently, we scoff at their superstitions and think ourselves far more sophisticated. Yet wherever there are natural springs today, there are folks who are convinced the water has curative properties. We scoff at the superstition, but just a few years ago, copper bracelets were all the rage for people struggling with arthritis until they were largely debunked by double-blind studies. We scoff at their superstitions, but how many are paying big bucks today for some herbal remedies that are unproven, untested, unregulated, maybe unhealthy? In our text, a man has been sick for 38 years and has spent most of those years sitting by the pool of Bethesda. 38 years. It's been his life's work. Four decades lying on a mat, waiting, hoping for a miracle to come from that pool. For 38 years, he's been trying to be the first one in. No one will help me he explains to Jesus. Someone always jumps in before me, he complains. Around the pool are other needy people, the blind, lame, paralyzed. So he and his sick friends gather every day and sit next to the water and in the shade offered by the roofed colonnades. They complain about their aches and pains, about how tough it is, how, the, how bad the economy is out there. They complain about the outsiders with their minor maladies racing into the pool before any of the regulars can even get on their feet. They complain about crooked, oppressed government and oppressive government and, and the rude treatment from the temple guards and the soaring costs of health care. They are helpless prisoners, maybe of some disease, or of their own genes, or of circumstance, or of societal forces, or of an all-powerful state. Long ago, they resigned themselves to this life by the pool and have learned to accommodate it. I don't think all of them are really interested in change. After all, there are some perks, some compensations for being a victim, sitting there by the pool, they're among friends, mostly. 
Passers-by often give alms, enough to buy bread for the day, a little extra during the holidays. You don't have to take responsibility for your own physical, emotional, spiritual welfare. At times, it can even be comfortable lying there by the pool, dozing, people watching, kvetching. We're well familiar with this mentality. If you're not happy or healthy or prosperous, it has to be the fault of someone or something, the government or your boss or your parents or forces in society that categorize you and pigeonhole you. For sure, to be categorized or lumped together by others is an affront to your personal dignity, for sure. Yet some are a little too quick to allow this to happen, to live down to the expectations others place on them. Some in our culture even seem to be vying for a crown of thorns. For when you're a victim, the payoff can mean you don't have to be compassionate or generous or grateful. You can put your own problems first. The payoff can mean you don't have to take responsibility for yourself. We can't know for sure, but I think that there's at least a possibility some of this is going on here. The man is sick. He's been sick 38 years. He can't make it into the pool. And the sense is that he's resigned himself to the status quo. He's a man waiting for life, waiting for something to happen in the future before he starts living in the present. We all do that. We hold off on being generous with our time, our skills, our money, until the time when we've got it all together. Someday I'll pray more and study scripture more and really engage in the life of the church, but I can't do that just now. I have to wait. Someday I'll be active in the community. I'll do my part, but I, now I simply don't have the time. Someday I'll deal with the addiction. Someday, after, maybe after the next promotion, I'll start tithing. Someday, I'll spend more time reading with the kids. Someday, I'll make an appointment with a professional counselor. Someday, I'll ask her to marry me and start a family, but for now, we're just going to live together. We are never told what this man's illness really is, but I think a part of the problem, at least, is fear. He's afraid of change, afraid to take chances. It seems he's comfortable in his routine, but there's, there's no joy. No joy that comes with producing something. No joy that comes by serving others. There's no courage in his life. No commitment to learning a new skill. Just day in and day out, resignation to the status quo. In the fourth century, Augustine wrote, Fix me, Lord, but not yet. And I think the whole business irritates Jesus. Do you notice? This man doesn't even say, fix me, Lord. It's Jesus who has to take the initiative with him. Do you want to be made well? What kind of question is that? Of course he does. But within the question of Jesus, there is another. Do you want to be a player rather than just a, a spectator, an observer? Do you really want to live life now? Or do you want to continue waiting for life? You want to be made well. Now the man starts complaining that he can't get into the pool fast enough. Someone always jumps in ahead of him. He's still focused on that darn pool as his hope. Maybe he's hoping Jesus will help him reach it in time. And for his part, Jesus, he doesn't even acknowledge the pool or its healing power. He ignores the whole business and simply says to the man, get up, take your bed, and walk. And to his credit, the man accepts the invitation. He takes a risk. He takes the first step away from his victimization, away from the security and comfort of his routine, away from the dependence on the charity of others, 
and he delves into a brand new life. So what about you? Do you want to be made well? Do you really want to change? Do you want to take complete responsibility for your own life? There are real limitations also for people of faith. People with strong faith can become genuine victims of a terrible disease or of crime or of a drunk driver. We can suffer disabling diseases of mind and body, but I've always admired those who do not define themselves by what they can no longer do. I admire those who make decisions every day based not on their limitations, their maladies, but on their potential, what they're still able to do. And I think that's part of being who God wants us to be, no matter where we are in life, young, old, in our prime. God has meaningful work for us to do all our lives. But being, our, being who God wants us to be, it doesn't happen just automatically, like an acorn turning into an oak tree or a kitten turning into a cat. We don't get there simply by putting in our time. It requires many deliberate choices, taking the first step every day to make something good happen. We become who God wants us to be when we work and serve with the welfare of our families in mind or this church or this city. It all requires a certain amount of change and courage and lots of tentative steps. And it starts when deep down we know that our lives matter and they have meaning. And the way we live them out can have a tremendous impact on the world around us. The task ahead isn't so much finding something worth loving, but to start loving that and those which God has already given you to love. Your spouse, for instance. Your children. Your church. Your community. You want to be healed. The man must answer the question Jesus put to him. Jesus isn't going to impose his own wishes on him. The man was free to choose. We all must answer that question. Do you want to change? If so, do it. Pick up your mat and go. Don't wait for someone to come along and drag you into the pool. Ask God's help in prayer. And then take the first steps toward becoming the person God wants you to be. There's an interesting postscript to this, this story. Uh, days later, Jesus bumps into the man again. This time it's in the temple, and that's an encouraging sign. Maybe he was there to give thanks for the mercy that had been given him. And Jesus says to him, see, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Jesus is kind of rough with this guy, churlish with this guy, isn't he? Apparently, it's what this man needed. While with others, he was far more gentle because that's what they needed. But what does he mean, sin no more? There's no indication of what sin Jesus is alluding to. And if the fellow had been lying around a mat for all those many years, the range of possibilities as far as sin goes are limited. Unless, unless his sin has something to do with lying around on the mat all those years, wasting his life, cheapening the precious life he had been given by the way he lived it. Could it be that Jesus is calling us individually, collectively, to sin no more, but rather to pick up our mats and walk? Is he calling us to love our lives enough to stand up and walk, to serve and work and think about someone else's troubles for a change. Well, what's the good news in this text? Let's start with the obvious. Jesus healed the man. The man didn't ask to be healed. He wasn't expecting to be healed. He didn't know that Jesus had those powers. But Jesus knew he could help and knew this man needed his help and he had compassion on the man. He saw a guy who was hemmed in and bound by forces outside his control and perhaps by some self-imposed limitations too. And 
those superstitions that are swirling in his head as well. Out of love and compassion, Jesus freed the man of all that was constraining him and told him to go. That same Jesus is at work in your life and, and mine with the same love and compassion. He sets prisoners free, not just those who are locked up by the authorities, but also those who are bound up by illness and injury, those who are hemmed in by cultural forces, those who are constrained by their own self-imposed limitations. Jesus sets prisoners free in this life and in the life to come. Sometimes he does that even without our asking. His grace always takes the first step. As Jesus intruded into this man's life with grace, so he intruded into your life with grace. For example, at your baptism, he came to you long before you could ever know to ask him for anything. He came and lifted that cloak that covered you in darkness. He introduced the light to you and converted you from being a victim of inherited sin and of death to an heir of God, co-heir with Christ. He became your brother, your friend, and surrounded you with brothers and sisters and, fam and family and friends to help you along the way. In the Lord's Supper, he intrudes repeatedly and gives you the gift of his body and blood. It changes you from within and releases you from all the binding straps of sin, strengthens you for service. Jesus takes the initiative with us all our lives, every day. He is the first to love you, long before you ever get around to praising him for the new day. Every day, he is the first to turn his attention to you. The intrusive grace that entered this man's life has entered your life and mine and has set us free. Not just to pick our beds and walk, but to take us to that place where our feet will leap like those of a deer and where we will run, not be weary, where there are no imprisoning forces within or without. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
prayers, we pray for Stephanie David, for Bob Lippert, Chad Frenzel, for Phyllis Zelmer and Bev Murray, who is in hospice care, for Marion Zimmerman, Mary Wagner, and Paul Zastrel. Pray for my wife's family, please, her parents uh, who are elderly, both whom have COVID, and for their primary caregivers, um, my wife's sister and her husband, both of whom have COVID, and others in the family who have COVID as well. Please stand for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart, with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying and for those who care for them, for those we've named and those whom we name in our hearts, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are waiting for life, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in Ukraine, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen.
I just cannot ask you to sit for this next hymn whose first line is rise, shine, you people, especially after that sermon. So we'll sing this one standing up. 